no matter kind of what roles people are playing, big or small, like all of us have built what we have now and all of us have the responsibility to carry it forward. The, the gullibility of all of us to misinformation, disinformation will have a cost. Well, yes, it's serious. And you, I mean, all you've got to do is take a shot of Lambeau Field and everybody in their hunter's orange and imagine a time where there was no deer in the state for them to hunt. Planet needs a restoration program of sufficient magnitude to save itself. And we say, well, we did it once in our democracy. Let the people do it. Good morning. This is uh, Hal Herring. I'm an outdoor writer in Montana. Uh, we're doing the uh, podcast and blast, got sponsored right. by Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. And uh, we got an interesting crew in assembled here on this snowy day uh we've got jim poswitz and andrew poswitz and land tony and we're going to be talking about uh jim's work and and life as a hunter and a conservation leader american conservation one of the top lights really in this in our country uh andrew poswitz is his son he's going to be in here for fact checking <laughs> uh, and uh so in some corners that still matters <laughs> in some corners that still matters even in an alt fact universe that's right uh we uh land and i've known jim for years uh uh jim has been a mentor to land since he was a child or a baby in baby. fact he was present at the birth i think i don't know if he's <laughs> he tells that story differently but i think he kicked my mom out of the car before uh, <laughs> before, before the actual born. birth yeah, happened yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, see i've i had six sons and i thought Birthing was like a drive through at McDonald's. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot of people just give you, a, we'll, we'll introduce Jim, but uh, to give you an idea of uh, Jim had often talked of, of followers of Aldo Leopold as being Leopoldian conservationists. Uh, and I I consider myself, I know Land does, a great student of Leopold. and But uh my translator and introduction to a lot of this has been Jim Poswitz. And so a lot of people in uh hunting world in Montana will call themselves actually Poswitzians. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Put it over here. I don't want in yeah. land for sure would be one of those. I would consider myself a po proud Poswitzian. Uh, and I don't want to blow him up too much here, but uh, <laughs> he's the author of three of four of really seminal texts in, in conservation and hunting. Um, he started out with Beyond Fair Chase, which uh, you may be familiar with if you're in hunter ed, it's become a standard text for American hunter education, as it should be. Um, he wrote Inherit the Hunt, which is a history of uh, really the hunting conservation movement in America, would you say, Jim? Yes. Um, and. Uh, he moved on to, to do rifle in hand, which was how uh, our conservation ethics were developed and, and pulled from the 19th century into the 20th century, really. Um, and his most recent is Taking a Bullet for Conservation. And it is, uh, well, uh, tell us tell us what that book is, Jim. Well, well, well that book is just uh, a uh, iteration of the story that went on in 1912 when Theodore Roosevelt, who had served uh, basically two terms as president and uh, decided not to seek a third term, during that period following his presidency, his successor was abandoning many of his conservation reforms, uh, along with other social and cultural reforms that the TR had put in place. And, and uh, examples would be that the first thing he did was he cut the Forest Service education budget. Uh. And then in, he got into a squabble over giving away coal in Alaska to the Guggenheim conglomerate. And a whistleblower goes to Pinchot. Pinchot says, you got to go to Taft. Taft fires a whistleblower. Pinchot takes to the street to defend wow. conservation. Taft fires Pinchot. <laughs> Pinchot sneaks over to Italy to meet Theodore Roosevelt after he was coming out of Africa, having hunted there for a better part of a year. And while he's touring Europe, Pinchot meets him in Italy. Pinchot travels under an assumed identity, so nobody would know this was happening. 
bri briefs Roosevelt on what's going on, and about a week or two later, Roosevelt gives his man in the arena speech at the Sorbonne in France. Mm -hmm. And in that speech, he talks about the man in the arena. And to me, he was telling the world he's getting back into the arena. Uh -huh. He tries it in 1912. Republicans hold 12 primaries. He enters all of them, wins nine of the 12. The party bosses deny this reformer the nomination. So then he runs as a candidate, as in a progressive candidate, Bull Moose Party identity, uh, in 1912. During that campaign in Milwaukee, a would-be assassin shoots him. And Roosevelt survives a gunshot and goes on to uh, finish second in the campaign, <laughs> Taft finishing third. Oh. And so uh, he did not regain the presidency, but he took the bullet, in, in my mind at least, because he was trying to protect his reforms and one of them primary one of them was conservation. Gotcha. And so around 1912, uh, all of that that he had accomplished was, was under real attack. Right. And in 2012, I thought, well, if I can get that story out. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I quickly wrote this tiny little book that has that story in it. Okay. Or that gotcha. is that story. So I've, I've been over to New York to like his, uh, his, his house that he grew up in. And they have We're talking that, about TR. Yeah, Theodore yeah. Roosevelt. And they have that shirt, you know, that he was wearing that oh. day. And they have the uh, the the glasses case that he's wearing and the speech. And so um, it's pretty powerful to see that and to think of like our presidential candidates today or any kind of politician that would actually finish a speech, you know, after being shot with a bullet that's, you know, lodged a half an inch from your heart. Like it's phenomenal. And like to be able to actually see that at his house yeah. just kind of puts it all together for me. And like, I mean, I think, you know, Roosevelt did so many things for this country, but in that very instance, like he cared about this stuff so much that he wanted to continue that, you know, continue on with that speech that day. So right. it's unfortunate, obviously, that the Bull Moose Party uh, and he didn't win. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. But um, uh, it's something to, to actually, you know, to definitely learn from. Yeah. So uh, was the, the would-be assassin, who was he? Do you, anybody know? I think he was a guy named Shrank. And I, you want to check that. Yeah. But I think he was eventually committed to uh, – a mental institution. Gotcha. And, uh, and so at any rate, uh, that's where he died. And I think the mental institution was in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh -huh. Well, well, I want to. We'll come. I want to come back to that actually. To as we as we get further into that. But uh, yeah. one of the things, Jim. Uh, I think people with that, with all the writing and all the conservation work. Um, I I think it'd be interesting just to get an idea of your history um, and and how you came into this. And I know we were talking about this giant mule deer that I was coveting on the wall over there uh, being from 1954. So you've got a breadth of history here that, that is really just amazing to me. Um, and I'd like to, I'd like to talk a little bit with you about how you came, where you came from and how you, how you, get to where you, you know how, how did how did you do what we do what we're talking about today what what drove you okay uh since uh, one of the contemporary issues is emigration my grandparents were all immigrants from lithuania in the very beginning of the 20th century the uh, czar was recruiting lithuanian peasants to use as cannon fodder mm -hmm. in the soviet sino war my grandfather ate tobacco and got so sick that he rejected him. <laughs> he got on a boat. Smart. I love it. He got on a boat and came to America with 50 bucks. Some, somehow he was able to s gather that. Yeah. Left his pregnant wife behind, got a job in a Pennsylvania coal mine, and was digging coal there. Uh, at least it fit a chronological fit. Uh huh. At the time, my by the, at the time they brought McKinley's body back to Washington D.C. and they drove through a corner. The train went through a corner of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And the coal miners were gathered at the portals, coal portals, to watch the train go by. Theoretically, one of those could have been my grandfather. Uh huh. But he got uh, in the coal wars and strikes of 1907. 
gotcha. they got uh, pretty badly abused. And he had by that time brought his wife and my first uncle back across to the United States. They moved to Wisconsin where he traded coal dust for sawdust and worked in the chair factory for the rest of his life. Uh -huh. And that's where my parents were born and that's where I was born. In what part Sheboygan, of Wisconsin? Wisconsin? Sheboygan? Yeah. Which is halfway between Green Bay and Milwaukee, but on the shore of Lake Michigan. So I was grew up an hour's drive from Packer Stadium. Gotcha. And my <laughs> father, who ran a gas station eventually after being a professional basketball player, uh, he chartered a bus to every Packer home game mm -hmm. uh, throughout my entire growing up sequence. Uh -huh. So it was pretty easy to see what fathers wanted for their sons. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you heartbroken about uh, Mr. Rogers and their downfall? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely crushed, but not heartbroken. <laughs> <laughs> Sore subject. So what uh, did did you fish and hunt in Chicago, in uh, Washington in Wisconsin too? When I grew up in Wisconsin, I was born in 1935. Okay, and so stayed there till uh, August of '53. So in that time window, there were no deer in the county where I lived. Well, there was very little game other than some cottontail rabbits and squirrels. Nobody in the family hunted or fished. Both the rivers that ran through the, our town were polluted, and uh, there was not much opportunity, but there was a strong desire. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no outdoor time for these Depression-era people because it was just work. Right. And uh, my grandfather, his brother, and a couple of my uncles owned saloons, and so I spent a lot of social time on a swivel chair mm -hmm. uh, in a smoke-filled <laughs> room. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're back inside around the wood stove here in Helena, Montana, after just uh, pushing some cars out of the uh, black ice and snow outside. <laughs> and, and all in a day's work. <laughs> all in a day's work. Some <laughs> interesting challenges up here on the hill. And first day of February. Uh, so, Jim, uh, so... We're, again, we're with Jim Posowitz, uh, and Jim, I would like to kind of push us to where uh, you left Wisconsin and came to Montana. As I look around your office here, I, I'm looking at all these antelope and this beautiful art, and it's, a, it's just a life immersed, really, in the northern Rockies and the prairies. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm envious of a lot of the big... That mule deer for sure. <laughs> I keep coming back to that, I know, <laughs> which I know came from down in the Madison Range, right? Yes. Uh, so could you tell us something about coming to, to Montana and, and when that happened and what, what pushed you this way? Okay. Um, I had an interest in the outdoors and nature. I had absolutely nobody in my mentoring network that was even aware of it during the Depression and post-Depression years where I was growing up through like the 1940s and World War II and, and all those other major sort of distractions. The county was uh, depleted of its wildlife. There were no deer in the county, uh, no hunting seasons on, on big game. Mm -hmm. I had this interest in nature that just kept nagging me. And I can remember very distinctly the day I made my decision to pursue fish and wildlife conservation. And I was sneaking up on some ducks on the Pigeon River mm -hmm. within walking distance of my house. Mm -hmm. And they were American gold eye. And when I flushed them, I, they flew, a, took off and were flying a loop back over me. And I rolled over onto my back. And these black and white ducks with their whistling wings were yeah. flying right overhead with a blue sky behind them. And I thought, this is what I want to be and do. Mm -hmm. And I was quite young yet. I was still in grade school, probably. Now, did you shoot one of those golden eyes? Pardon? Did you shoot one of those golden eyes? No, this was not during a hunting season. Oh, okay. and, right, uh, and I didn't have a gun or anything like that. And 
I've shot one and they taste horrible. Yeah, they're rough. <laughs> <laughs> but the visuals and the, and the yeah, audio you know, part of that, you know, I hear you, that man. there is such thing as nature and wildlife. And so that's when I got the direction. I I got into Boy Scouts because they had a, scout, a summer camp. And, yeah. and uh, they talked about nature and the outdoors and learned quite a bit there. Eventually, I became a counselor in a in Boy Scout camp. Uh, this is in the late 40s. And uh, one of my father's ways of making some additional money was to sell Christmas trees. And that involved driving up to northern Wisconsin, buying trees, hauling them back, and selling them on the gas station lot through that he ran, ran a gas service station. One of his buddies bought a deer from an Indian up there, and I got a foot from that deer. Uh -huh. And as a scout counselor, I would mark the woods with that deer foot. Wow. <laughs> and then we would take nature hikes and show the boys the deer tracks. And then one night a week, one of the counselors would take an old mounted deer head out of the mess hall, sit down in the swamp with it, and we'd have a night hike, follow the tracks, shine the deer, and the boys went home thinking they saw a deer. Wow. And that's how depleted it was, but how in interested we were in it and how right. it always right. caught the interest of, of other, you know, of human beings. I mean, well, to, to, can you, do you think people can even imagine who are in northern or central Wisconsin now that there was a time when that was necessary? That's how you trained your hunters. Well, or people or, that were interested in nature or just woke, wanted or, to be well, outdoors. Uh, right, awoke. I, when you were telling the story about the gold, I keep thinking of this quote, and I can't remember where it comes from, but that we spend our lives in pursuit of or, or of the thing where uh, where our soul first awakened. You know, when you look at something, then you know that's that's your thing. Wow, that's know. a good. That's a. I'll I'll find it for you and send it to you. Yeah, that's excellent uh, condensation. It, it of what was the first thing I thought moment. of when you were talking when I when you gave me that image of those gold eye. Um, but yeah, let's get back to it. I just I just was struck by the idea of Wisconsin being such a deer hunting state. Um, yeah, yeah, and I I think that's one of the sort of two critical lessons that nobody knows anymore for reasons that escape me was that. What we have isn't about preserving what's always been here. It was. It's about this massive effort that went to restoring what was once here, and now we're conserving that restoration. That's and right. Every time I talk to people about how this used to be barren, right? You just get the blank stare. You like, bet. Oh, is that serious? Right. What? Well, yes, it's serious. And you. I mean, all you got to do is take a shot of Lambeau Field and everybody in their hunter's orange, right? And imagine <laughs> a time where there was no deer in the state for them to hunt, right? I don't know what they wore to the games then, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's it's I think it's hard to imagine, and and what you're talking about is success is is hard work and, and people making hard decisions and creating something that's that's incredibly successful um, on on every level on 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 health and on awareness of of nature and on awareness of ecosystems and on awareness that we're not alone on the planet that we share it with all these incredible creatures, I mean. On every level, that success is, is is with us all the time, so much so that people seem to have forgotten. Well, it's, what's crazy to me is that we're talking about the 1940s right? when he's doing that. With like that with, right. That's, that's right. 70 years ago. You right. know, like, I mean, we're, we're not that far away from no. it. So this great success that we're talking about is still kind of this experiment, right, right. that Jim has really lived through. Right. So keep going, please, Jill. Well, we wish to, I would like to get back to Land's point, but to keep going on the one, you know, tr tr trajectory we're on here so there were two interests in in me one was nature and one was athletics because that's what was being uh, part of the culture there right and uh, every time I'd find my name in the in the paper during high school years it would be Jim Posowitz son of the once great Johnny <laughs> because my dad was a really uh -huh. exceptional professional basketball player when they earned almost nothing. Right. But that that's a whole other story. Gotcha. But nonetheless, it's what fathers wanted for their sons. You bet. It's what I spent most of my high school time doing. And uh, Montana wasn't on the radar at all. Right. And uh, I make up a story that 
when we played Green Bay East, and this would be in 1952. Uh, they didn't have a field for, for Green Bay East High School, so we played on City Stadium Field, which is the same field the Packers played on. Uh -huh. and, and I remember the game quite well because all the Green Bay schools just kicked the heck out of us any time we played them. Mm -hmm. But here we were in City Stadium getting ourselves pretty badly beaten, but I was the center linebacker, and our line was porous. And I can remember over the loudspeaker, which in most of the places we played didn't even have loudspeakers, right. but this Packer field did. And the announcer said, tackle again by Posowitz. <laughs> 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 and I think they heard that in Montana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> one night I'm sitting after basketball practice with my basketball coach, and he said, what do you want to do with your life and all that? And I said, well, I want to go into wildlife conservation. And he said, well, maybe I got a place for you. And he knew the coach at Montana State who had previously coached in the Wisconsin uh -huh. uh, college system. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I made the connection and uh, came out and interviewed me and uh, got recruited to play at Montana State. And so that's how I, I got you. I got out. The, so first, I got I out. I didn't the know that history. We, and right we don't there. hold it totally against them. You know, it brought. Jim Paws was to Montana, which right. the state would be a lot different. And <laughs> because he plays for the Bobcats, we kind of kind of let that go a little bit. <laughs> they like not to talk about it because in 56, we beat them in Missoula right. for the first time in forever. The humiliation is still not worn off. <laughs> <laughs> well, they won, fact, won I think the scab was pulled off this year, wasn't oh, it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can bring up the 16 years in a row if you want to. But, uh, <laughs> We're not interested in old history. <laughs> right. <laughs> After well, I was, I was a slow learner, so I couldn't play that long. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what uh, what was it like here? I, and one thing I'd be sure of is that all that power from the football field and the basketball court makes you a person pretty ready for the Rocky Mountains and, and living outside in Montana, I would think. Physically. Yeah, physically, for sure. You're just dying to climb those hills, right, you know, right. and wander those trails and uh, – that's uh, and ha and to have the interest, uh, basically, uh, part of who you are already. Right. And then to have the opportunity, and of course, when I got to Montana in, in 1953, uh, the restoration of wildlife had reached a point where there was place was overrun with deer. Uh huh. And they were having extended seasons, and they were trying well. to get. Uh, go beyond the buck law and to shoot either sex deer. Uh -huh. And those were the struggles that were going on out in the forest and out on the public and lands. This is mostly mule deer? Or it's mostly mule deer at that time, yeah. And I can remember when I passed the six-month point of my being in Montana, which made me eligible to be a resident. Yes, sir, I remember it too. <laughs> yeah. and, and I came in August, and so that was uh, January, but there was an extended mule deer season uh -huh. in the Bridger Mountains. I had hit the six-month point. I bought a license, borrowed a gun, and went out and shot my first deer wow. about 400 yards north of the M on the end of the Bridger Mountains, the big yeah, white. Bozeman, yeah. M. Yeah. Right. And that was my first deer. Wow. So. And how old were you? Well, I was a freshman in college then. Gotcha. Right. I know you said earlier when we started that uh, it, playing football meant that your, your hunting seasons were blocked for for a long time, and without the extended season, it would be hard to, to actually get into the hills and hunt. Well, that's right. Yeah. It was, and uh, but that time period was just happened to coincide with the overabundance of deer, wow. and it was predictable that there would be extended seasons just yeah. to get the deer numbers down because yeah. they were beating up their winter ranges mm. and things of that mm. nature. So, and that was uh, so that fifty three. That was the well. It was actually January of '54. Gotcha. And what uh, was the was the fishing really good? Was the, I mean, what was it like here then? Well, we would fish the Madison River because and the Gallatin, which were close. Mm -hmm. Our fishing skills were usually with 
fly rods but hooks with bait on them and right. would, and, or sculpins that we would catch out of the river. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, every chance we got, we, we, would, we would do that rather than trying to learn what we were in college for. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and many people can claim that same, right. uh, that same problem. I think I knew every place where you could catch fish around Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and I often have nightmares that I've lost all my college textbooks. You know, I still have that dream because we spent so much time on North River chasing these big stripers. As soon as I realized they were there, that was the end of most of the class. See, I thought your nightmare was going to be that all your spots that used to go fish stripers are gone. Like, nope. your nightmare is about books, and yeah. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> it's those things, you know, that you just didn't do. Right. That you were supposed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I caught a lot of fish. <laughs> yeah. But I think one of the points at the time was I didn't know why that national forest was there. Right. I didn't know why those deer were swarming all over the hillside. Right. I didn't know any of the conservation history. Mm -hmm. And probably the biggest handicap I've lived with is I was never taught that in college. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were taught biology. Right. And our biological me teachers and mentors did not teach history, did not teach philosophy, did not teach ethics, which was in time became the most important components of what I should have known when I started work for the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks or Fish uh -huh. and Game. And then I had none of that in my preparation. So uh, tell me about that. Why, why is that the most important part of what you were doing? Well, because what you're looking at in the, in the North American conservation ethic, the North American model, you're looking at an, an experiment in human history mm -hmm. where a nation was created where the people declared themselves to be free and equal and sovereign. And all of our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, not one of them says fish wildlife. And so the European model, uh, which our early pilgrims and pioneers uh, were familiar with, was uh, hunting was the privilege of the royalty in this notion that wildlife did not attach to property or power was alien to them. Right. And so in 1842, there's a very important court case in American history where it was a dispute over oysters in the New Jersey Meadowlands, and the landowner traced the title of his property back to the King of England to, in a land grant to the Duke of York that included the fishings, hawkings, huntings, and fowlings, a typical European model. Right. But the Supreme Court, because of an oyster man, said, wait a minute, the people in America declared themselves to be the sovereign. And in that capacity, these values are to be held in trust for the people right. and managed as a public trust by the states. Huge court decision. That was 16 years before Theodore Roosevelt was born. Mm -hmm. 16 years after Theodore Roosevelt died, I was born. Mm -hmm. That's the length of this experiment wow. in human nature, human culture, human societies, and right. our relationship with nature. And and I, Jim, I, I read some of the piece you, you had sent me that you're working on that refers to that New Jersey oyster, oyster man. And uh, where will that appear for people who are interested in following up on this? Well, it hasn't been published yet. That was just a draft of something I was I'm currently writing on. But that is some of that stuff is in Inherit the Hunt. Okay. And, uh, and in Rifle in Hand both. And right. I think maybe in all my books I okay. eventually touch on that. Uh, and uh, w one of the places you do see it is in the state charters for the original 13 colonies as they talk about how that is now the providence of the people. Right. And so when the Supreme Court went in and decided that case, they went back to the state charters and found it. Gotcha. So I don't want to jump ahead too far, I guess, but like, so we're talking about how short a kind of time frame that we're looking at. I mean, that 1842 case, you know, Theodore Roosevelt was born 16 years later. Roosevelt lives, does some great things for us. You're born 16 years later, and now you're 81, 82, 81. So it's a short, short time frame. Mm -hmm. Like, Jim, as you look at, like, the history, which I think you always tell me, you know, about, you know, being a student in history, you can learn about kind of where things came from, also learn from mistakes, and learn from some successes, right? I think that's part of it. As you look at now where you are, sitting at kind of where our conservation community is right now, 
do you feel like our North American model is safe? No, I think we have to re we have to revisit this issue by the generation. The degree to which we use the tools we have, like this conversation, to tell the story from one generation right. to the next. You know, when a new generation comes in, where do they go for the story? I mean, here I went through two degrees in fish and wildlife management and never heard any of this in the course of that education. Right. You study American history or you study Montana history, it is almost always the history of how a place was exploited. Mm -hmm. right. you know, here comes Lewis and Clark, followed by the fur trade, followed by the miners, followed by the loggers, followed by the Aggies. It's always the history of how we exploit a place. Right. Yet you talk to somebody and say, what do you value now at living in Montana? And it's always the free flowing rivers, the trout fishing, the wild country, the wildlife, and these cultural and social amenities. And yet, we are almost never taught how those came about. Right. I mean, like I say, I went through, clear through two degrees in college and never knew all the things that Theodore Roosevelt put in place. Mm -hmm. You know something, Jim, I don't know, it, you could say the same thing about agriculture. Uh, uh, we, we talk about the Iowa and uh, parts of Alabama and all uh, as these, as this, you know, productive, the bread basket. Um, and after the Dust Bowl, that was totally untrue. And we took somehow, I don't know the story of that. That We don't know the history of how we recovered from the Dust Bowl. It's a good one, though. I mean, it's a great one. I mean, and it, and it has the hunter thread so through it, right? Like oh putting the lid yeah. back on the prairie so and like out of bad times came good things. Right. So how do, how do, uh, how does anybody, well, you, you saw about revisit, but how does anybody, uh, cr keep what they've got if they don't know how they got it i mean you're you're ripe at any moment to be the gullible the sucker a, a fool and his money soon parted you know sure you have no idea how you got there it, it's it's uh i think i think it's one of the biggest issues we have today in in a lot of different things especially in hunting and conservation well and you know like i say you take the montana history that you're currently taught in the grade schools and right. middle schools and high schools rarely is the history of conservation a part of that right it's always the copper kings and those right. those guys right. and, and still you take a contemporary activist who just knows it's the right thing to be doing right if you give them the story you empower them you know instead of hearing it from me i'll spit out a quote or two and you hear it from a guy whose likeness we chiseled into Mount Rushmore, for God's sakes. Right. Because we were so impressed with what he did. Right. And what he did was set aside just about 10% of America, 230 million acres, as national forests, national parks, national monuments, uh, wildlife refuges, game ranges. Right. 10% of America. One guy. Right. And that one guy got his conservation epiphany off the Great Plains of Montana mm -hmm. because he was there. He was th there one month after the last commercial slaughter. Right. And he came west as a 24-year-old looking for a chance to shoot a buffalo. And we're talking about 1883? 1883. 18, yeah. And uh, September. Right. So and Roosevelt came from, from New York? Came, he, he was a from? New York State legislator at the right. time, but as growing up, he read all the adventure books and everything, right. and he just wanted to come and shoot a buffalo. Right. The guy who invited him decided not to go, but Roosevelt came anyhow, got into little, little Missouri, North Dakota, mm -hmm. hired a guide, borrowed a gun. I'm thinking, here's, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like me showed up at <laughs> Bozeman, buying right. a license, borrowed a gun, going right. out. right. But I went out. I had a place to go because Theodore Roosevelt set it aside as gotcha. National Forest. Didn't know it then. Right. Didn't know it till 50 years later. Right. But how that enriched the experience right. and the memory. Thinking, wow, thanks, TR. Right. But anyhow, he comes out here, shoots the buffalo, has a personal tragedy back home, but comes back to live for a short period of time. And he left this account of what Montana looked like be 
uh, when he talked to a rancher who was looking for open range grazing, mm -hmm. and he made a journey of a thousand miles on horseback, the rancher did, mm -hmm. along Montana's Milk River and back. So that's like from the North Dakota border to within sight of Glacier you and back. And then Roosevelt wrote, to use the ranchman's own words, I was never out of sight of a dead buffalo and never in sight of a live one. Huh. We were the boneyard of North America. Right. And that's where we started. And within a couple of years, TR and Grinnell formed the Boone and Crockett Club for the introduction of the sporting code and the restoration of big game. Huh. And that was 1887. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, that's what we looked like in 1887. Right. Nothing but rotting bones being gathered up to do make fertilizer. Any, do you have any thoughts on why uh, unique in the world that as far as I know that we were, we as a people were so, we, we bas we basically pillaged the wildlife resource in this country, but unique in the world. What do you have any thoughts on why? Who who were we when we decided that when T R and, and Grinnell and everybody decided that this could be fixed? We were a democracy. Mm -hmm. We were free people, and we could do anything we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And th we decided we wanted to not live without a without a wildlife resource. Gotcha. So individuals, you think? I mean, it individuals wasn't like a popping up at, at random, just like uh, you know, when the on the Rocky Mountain Front, mm -hmm. when when guys like Ehlers Colk ride in there and leave us this observation, right? And one generation later, here comes a bookstore operator, Tom Maselt, and a rancher, Carl Malone, mm -hmm. and they put up five thousand bucks each. To hold the Sun River game range so that we right. could solve that problem. Right. And they keep popping up, you know. And uh, the more you tell the story about how that works in a democracy, how you can go from, uh, like, the foundation of the backcountry hunters and anglers. Mm -hmm. Idea of a couple guys. Right. And turn it into a vigorous program gotcha. that people who... Uh, say this is part of what I want this country to be. Right. So if I'm like, if I'm sitting here and, and I'm just kind of summarizing, but it's a little bit as the, I just want to see if I'm hearing this right, is that, you know, we first separated ourselves really apart from all over the parts of the world because the people, the people were going to be the sovereign nation and those, that wildlife and the land was going to belong to us, right? And so it was way different than that kind of European feudal model. And then, but that really, it didn't help us take fire with our conservation ethic at that point. Like, it, it just kind of was something that was there. And then we have these tragic events that were the decimation of wildlife that you described, you know, the rancher and his thousand mile journey. And so that's where we get the Boone and Crockett Club. That's what starts to influence Roosevelt. And then throughout time, we've had these leaders pop up, like in the dirty 30s. It was, you know, uh, Ding Darling and, you know, the first right. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And, and so there's been these. So it seems like it's been organic in a little way, like the North American model. And I want to get you back to like, okay, so we're here now. We're living in probably the best of times. I mean, you know, we've got elk crawling out of the woods right now and here in Montana. Um, you know, the, the wolves might, the discussion might tell you different, but we're over objective most everywhere w right. for elk. You know, we've got white-tailed deer everywhere. We got. Well, know, I had one cow tag and one either sex tag in my home country around Augusta this year. Yeah, I mean, you got plenty of elk. I mean, we got, and, and, and the hunting was good. It's, it's not easy. Right. But it's good. So, I mean, and so, like, I mean, we're living in great times. There's this lack of knowledge of where we've come from in such a short amount of time. Like, do you still feel like, like, this North American model is as strong um, if we continue to tell the story? Or what, what are your thoughts there? You know, I went through an entire career at Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and never heard the words North American model. Mm -hmm. North American model stems from the Governor's Symposium Series on the North American Hunting Heritage that was launched in Montana um, during the governorship of Governor Stan Stevens, Republican governor, mm -hmm. and uh, 
it was at a time when the st we had a state law that required every buffalo to set foot on the Yellowstone National Park was to be shot. Right. And we had rangers and game wardens leading people to the sites where this would happen and, and execute following that law. And I happened to be in Washington, D.C., and this was probably the next to last year that I was in Fish and Game. And all I could hear on talk radio was the public's outrage at what we were doing with the Yellowstone Park bison. Mm -hmm. And that winter, it had gone up, I think it was the winter of uh, maybe 88 or 89, gone up to over 500. And Five hunting bison was being shot. Right. Yeah. <coughs> and, uh, and hunting was being vilified from coast to coast because of it. We're calling it hunting, you know, and it was just uh, directed shooting. But at any rate, I came home and we had the staff meeting of the first uh, director appointed by Stan Stevens. And I got up at the staff meeting and I said, is there anybody here that thinks we're doing the right thing? And not a hand went up. Mm -hmm. And then we set aside an objective to end, repeal that law. And, and then the other thing we did was had the idea of having this governor's symposium on the North American hunting heritage to try to repair hunting. Mm -hmm. At that first symposium, two messages came out of it. Uh, one was we had to clean up the act. And two was, as conservationists, we either lead or become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And those were the two themes that emerged from that conference. And those latter words are taken right out of Jay Hare of the National Wildlife Federation's uh, presentation at that conference. But out of that governor's symposium series emerged the North American model and its articulation, initially by Geist, Mahoney, and Oregon. Mm -hmm. And then it... Uh, basically becomes part of the conversation from that point on, that there is such a thing as this North American model. It has seven basic principles that they describe, and it's still part of the conversation. Do you think, again, uh, do you think again that that model is safe? I mean, there's some people talking about trying to tweak it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and like when I hear that, I get nervous. Sure. Right? Because it's, I mean, no. again, like we've, it's been a short history. It's been working. Um, but your thoughts on that, please? Well, the thoughts on it come from the fact that the reason wildlife went into a boneyard was because of the commercial value that was there and it was being exploited. Mm -hmm. When we went into the depths of the wildlife's depression, you know, when wildlife populations were literally decimated or gone, they no longer became uh, monetarily attractive. We went through the Dust Bowl, the Dirty Thirties, and that's when the conservation movement, in the worst hard times, calls the first North American Wildlife Conference, and this time it's Franklin Roosevelt, right. and forms the National Wildlife Federation, Ducks Unlimited forms in that era, and the hunters rally rather than get depressed. Uh, passed the Pittman-Robertson Act in 1937 to fund their desire and their dreams. And commercial interests were on the sidelines. Of course, now that the wildlife restoration has reached a great abundance, uh, all of a sudden we got you know leasing of hunting properties and all that jazz to try and financially exploit this public resource. And so the pressure... Uh, the, you know, the better we do, the more pressure there uh, comes to, uh, upon to the model yeah. right. to try to compromise it with all kinds of uh, oh, adjustments that allow uh, commercial exploitation. Mm -hmm. and, and that'll be a constant. It's uh, been, a, you know, it's what triggered the thing to begin with. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I guess the most remarkable thing in that, uh, brief history was the fact that in this depths of the depression the hunters and anglers say we can do better yeah. the people come step forward in the right. democracy is the point we talked about later this is a democracy you can do this stuff 
Right. Yeah, and you just have to take the plunge. Well, that's, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm, pr I'm prodding you a little bit because I feel like, you know, we're in this time right now, again, of abundance, but then people are trying to take it away from us, you know, and I think ever since, you know, Roosevelt helped set this kind of legacy into motion that people have been trying to steal it. I mean, like you said, Taft, you know, right away starts, you know, undoing some of his great things. Um, you know, had senators from Montana, you know, William Clark, that didn't want him to uh, to uh, set any of these lands aside because they want to exploit them. So it's like that's been around for a while. But right now there's this huge push, you know, and it's coming. I think it's more organized and it's more better funded. And what I'm seeing, at least in the last couple of weeks, is this undeniable uh, awakening of sportsmen. And I mean, we had the rally here, you know, on Monday at the Capitol. They had like 1,200 people there now. Um, you know, there's hunters and anglers and hikers and backpackers and mountain bikers there. But what I'm seeing online, there's a Congressman Chaffetz who's out of Utah who's proposing, you know, to uh, sell up to 3 million acres. He's getting hammered right now. And, and that is because I think people are more aware of this right now. And so what I'm trying to say is I think out of these, like, dark times, which we've had before, whether that was in the um, turn of the century or on the 30s, uh, you know, when we did the Clean Air and Clean Water Act because our you know, rivers were on fire, it feels like we're in one of those dark times right now where people are trying to steal these public lands for us. And what I'm hoping is that out of that comes like this awakening and uh, engagement by hunters. And so not only can we take that uh, thing that galvanizes us, but then we can pivot into stuff that actually matters on our public lands, you know, that we can work on proactive things rather than playing defense. Is that a fair observation? Oh, it's absolutely true, you know, because of the success. Yeah. Right. The capitalistic model virtually requires <laughs> You know, that somebody try to capitalize on it. Right. I mean, if you go to the SHOT Show, it's all commerce. Mm -hmm. At one time, those national conventions, uh, not of the SHOT Show, but of things like the North American Wildlife Conference, it was all conservation. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be a constant in the economic model that we live by in America. And uh, we can't take for granted that we've come so far and now we've got it cemented in. Mm -hmm. right. In fact, I think, uh, and, and if you look in the broader context, globally, I mean, if we're going to save the planet, we got to have some major reforms in how we live. Mm -hmm. And the only model I can think of is the North American model of wildlife restoration. We have demonstrated that we can restore a natural resource to an entire continent in a democracy by listening to the people. Mm -hmm. And now we're, it's more than continental, it's global. But I don't know of any other model other than what the North American wildlife restoration model mm -hmm. that one could point to where we have taken a totally depleted and imperiled resource and restored it to a marvelous abundance. Right. And it, it goes back, it's, there's some there's some heavy stuff I'm thinking in here how it works, but it goes back to people being participants in a participatory democracy. You know, they they have the uh, the power to to act in a way that you don't in another society, in a in a more authoritarian or totalitarian society, you know. None of those places are, are, are models of, of quality of life or clean water or, or wildlife none of them are well and so we've married something beautiful here if as as franklin said if we can keep it right all we got to do is go to the birthplace of civilization right between the tigris and euphrates rivers where civilization was born present-day iraq in the time of an early dictator, leader, you know, potentate or whatever, right. uh, whose name was Gilgamesh, they wanted to build a great city, have a city kingdom. The landscape was covered by a forest so dense that the sunlight could not reach the ground. Mm -hmm. And now it's those rubble heaps and sand piles where people are blowing each other up for whatever reason they can muster. Right. That's the alternative where you just ignore the fact that we are, in fact, a natural being right. produced by nature, a part of nature, and maybe even with a attraction and affinity to nature. And 
planet needs a restoration program of sufficient magnitude to save itself. Right. And we say, well, we did it once in our democracy. Mm -hmm. Let the people do it. Get rid of the rulers and the potentates and the kings right. and tell the people the truth and give them the tools to restore. And we did it in the little time window between 1842 and 2017. But I think the important thing to remember is that didn't just happen organically. It happened intentionally. And that, to your point, Land, about how do you defend it, it's not going to defend itself. And you can rely on its inherent goodness and be certain that it's going to come through unharmed, but you'd be wrong. And it takes intentional acts, whether it's this guy in the crazy mountains who's uh, fighting his trespassing ticket right. or whether it's showing up for the rally. It's not going to happen organically yeah. because the forces on the seeking to exploit it have a lot of money and a lot of resources. Yeah. Kids have got a damaged gene pool. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, the point I think that I try to make, too, is like we don't have billions, but we got the people, right? And as long as the people stand up, it's that democracy and that squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? And, like, Again, I think this guy, uh, Congressman Chaffetz from uh, Utah, is proposing to sell, you know, three million acres in the ten western states. Uh, and he's looking for precedent too. Yeah, I mean, that's what yeah. he I mean totally that is. I, I, that's what I keep going back to. I mean, it's this kind of like a bad penny; it keeps coming back up, you know. And there, everybody's looking for precedent because there's a cash cow out there, big time. And so I think, you know. like, what's interesting though with me, which has happened the last couple of days, is that you know we're talking about a new medium here, a podcast. Instagram is a new medium, right? And it's a place where people show pictures all the time. Right. So Mr. Chaffetz has his own Instagram account. It's called Jason in the House, which is a pretty good play on words, by the way. Right. Um, but uh, if you go to his Instagram account right now, there's thousands of comments, and it's all about how bad this bill is and to keep it public. And so, mm -hmm. like, there's been this awakening by the sportsman community, and they're using this new platform to try to affect them. Now, has he done anything yet? He hasn't done anything yet. Um, but hopefully, you know, it's something that we get done. And I, and I just like, I think Jim, you know, and telling the story is huge and then using these new mediums, you know, to actually yeah. take action and that's the way democracy works. So, um, hopefully we're able to get him to pull those bills back and we're gonna have a meeting with him next week in DC to see if he will. But, um, I think you're right. He's trying to start precedent and so that, uh, they can, you know, go out and even try to sell more of it. What, and I would, uh, one of the things that's concerned me most, um, in covering conservation just recently is the and and having those stories then posted on say Facebook or other social media is the barrage of uh of kind of attacks on just conservation sure. of any sort. I mean I wrote a piece about the uh, oil spill in the Yellowstone and there was somebody wrote in that there were more pollution caused by buffalo pre settlement than we've ever done to the Yellowstone ever. Um there's an, a bizarre to me we have to have Jim stories. We have to have those books to understand what the actual history was because there's the, we talked about alt facts or whatever <laughs> earlier. It's like there's there's the, the gullibility of all of us mm -hmm. to misinformation, disinformation will have a cost. And you you cannot keep what you uh, cut what you have. Once again, if you don't know how you got it, and you don't know what actually threatens it. Well, that's what I think, like, hopefully, I mean, this this threat to sell our public land is real. But, again, I think we can fight it back, but it's going to help us tell this story, too, right? Like, like, well, where did that land come from, you know? Right. I mean, you talked, I mean, we were, you know, talking earlier, like, well, I just knew that I could go run around that national forest and that would be a landmine. Right. I didn't know how it got there, but, you know, it's and always going to be there, and right? And, you and know? why like has it attained this value now that it is a target for, for these interests, right? Well, the Nantahalia? And, and that cost money, and almost all of the money that went to repair it was public dollars. It cost treasure. And I asked somebody the other day, I said, you know, we've got the, the Treaty of, say, Guadalupe Hidalgo, which was at the end of the Mexican War. We paid blood and treasure for those lands. Right. Why would somebody, under what legal stricture, could somebody simply award those lands to anybody? Well, yep. it, it's funny. I was th my overwhelming thought at the rally last week was, I wonder what would ha what what the counter rally would look like. And the truth uh. is, you wouldn't have anybody there. <laughs> no people would show up. Right. What because, are they showing up for? Right. You, right. you would have probably mining companies. Right. I can't think of who else would show up. Right. right. You know, and that's I think that's part of this movement though is that they. 
like you think about like Mal here, right? <laughs> like Mal here and this this misinformation about how oh the federal government is bad and they're taking things from you. Well, what that what they did in that protest and what they wanted to do is return that quote unquote to the people. Right. Well, who are those people? Those people, you know, like are right. single use that want to exploit it versus these lands that are open to everybody, right? right? And so like there's this misinformation there, and so their rally is like, you know, it obviously uh, caught a lot of attention. But in the wrong way, in some ways, and people were sometimes sympathetic until they found out actually what was at stake and what was going right. on. Right, and I I know that at the mall here, uh, we listened to some of the Bundy guys saying that we're going to give it back to the people. And I think my son's 16, you know, and he said, "Well, that's exactly what the wildlife refuge was set up <laughs> yeah. for in the first place. Exactly <laughs> what they're talking about." Right. Um. So, Jim, I I had a couple of questions on this thing that, that Land and I had talked about, and uh. Do you think, are we missing anything critical to keeping this success story going right now? Well, obviously not, because this is the most critical part of it, is to capture the stories and figure out how we can make that a part of of what we teach people in our society and in our culture right from the beginning. The fact that it slipped by our educational system as it developed through the a ages uh, or through the years uh, is too bad. But nonetheless, uh, we told history from only one perspective. Right. <coughs> and of course, it, in the process, that history did produce some dramatic, tragic moments like the, the buffalo killing and, and right. things of that nature. But the fact that we as a people, exterior to the institutions we created to do it, you know, we created these big institutions, but today you look over in the non-government world and it is loaded with groups rise, popping up in our democracy to make sure that the vision and, and the expectations of our founders and people who put us on this course mm -hmm. is not abandoned right. because the, c the competing interests who would exploit every opportunity available, and that's part of the uh, capitalistic economic model. Right. That's, that's their assignment. Sure. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and our assignment yeah. is to you know, preserve the, th the uh, amenities that make life worth living. Or as Theodore said, that add to the beauty of life and therefore the joy of living. Right. And people on our side of the battle know exactly what that tastes like and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I ran into it in 1913, or 2013, mm -hmm. sitting in the dark in the woods, waiting for the sun to come up, gales up on top of the mountain, checking some high meadows, again, waiting for, for daylight. National Forest within walking distance of our house. And three total strangers come up the trail to me. And the father, and what I take to be the father and two sons, the father halts the boys, and they're standing like poster children in a hunter education class. Guns under complete control, serious expressions on their faces. Mm -hmm. And the father tiptoes up to this old man they found sitting in the woods. <laughs> And he says to me, we don't want to get ahead of you. He whispers it. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the you know, group, and I said, you know, I think I know what I see here. And I want you ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And then the father says, the young boy can shoot a cow elk if he sees one. And so I look at the kid, give him a little smile, and give him the thumbs up. And here's an old guy communicating with a first-time hunter, probably. Mm -hmm. And the kid's face lights up in the dark. He is so excited. Big smile it replaces this put-on you know, right. hunter safety look. Yeah. But I thought, holy mackerel. And when they move on up the trail, I thought, there it is. The beauty of life and the joy of living. That's why the guy set aside this national forest for us and here were three generations, which they refer to as those generations within the womb of time, mm -hmm. meeting each other. And I had the privilege of knowing why 
a lot of that was happening, why those elk were there, why those people were there, and why I was there. Well, it was a very emotional moment. Well, you talk about you talk about collecting a trophy. You bet. There it was. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, uh, I think something you just brought up, Jim, that trophy, is like that's a big talk right now is just like trophy hunting, right? And like I think there's a lot of the non-hunting public they would come into your house and see this antelope, see that elk over there, see the mule deer. And be like, oh, Jim's a big trophy hunter. And, and that's all he cares about is those heads on the wall. You know, and I think, like, what they don't realize, and I heard it described the other day, and I thought it was really good, is that it's like the, these things on the wall are like the last, like, last chapter or the last paragraph of that book, you know, that got you there. And the, all that adventure and, like, the toils and challenges that brought you to is, like, the first 90% of that book. And so... While these are, are something for all of us to remember by, when you only see them as that trophy, like you're not you're not even reading any part of the book, and I like the, the majority of the book, and you're right. not being enriched by that. And I think um, the story you just told. I mean, I I had the good fortune of uh, drawing a bighorn sheep tag this year, and you know there was lots of ups and downs of that hunt, and ended up killing one um, on the fifteenth day. But I will tell you that that hunt will be always be memorable. But the most memorable hunt was a doe hunt that I did with my kids, where they're five feet behind me an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, you know, first time they're ever going to see anything killed right right in front of them. And it all happens like clockwork. It's the most beautiful thing. And, like, we ate those back straps that dinner or that night for dinner. And, and like, to me, that's probably more – that's the trophy that I got, you know, and it's this little teeny doe. Like, I think she's a year and a half. Like, I mean, just great eating. But, like, you know, not your big antlered animal. <laughs> but, like, I would probably remember that one more than I will with my bighorn sheep, right. to be totally honest. That's that trophy I think that we're all looking for. And I think that the non-hunting public doesn't understand that there's a, there's a lot more than just pulling that trigger out there. Well, and the hunting public has got to know the story because if I hadn't known all that TR did and where that yeah. land came from, that uh, all would have missed me. Right. It would have just that been three other hunters way. hunting the same place I yeah, am, you know. I hear you. Instead, it was, you know, the epitome of what this whole thing uh, means to a society. Right. So as long as we tell this story, you think we're okay? Well, each generation's challenges uh, change somewhat. You know, the boys of the dirty 30s, they had their work cut out for them. Sure. <coughs> they focused on habitat. They focused on habitat, and they succeeded. And they restocked the thing. Mm -hmm. And, of course, their, their appreciation for the association of ducks to potholes, for example, right. was very profound and very real and very meaningful to them. And they weren't just shooting a duck out of the sky. They were shooting a sustainable resource that came from the pothole that they put out on the landscape. And uh, now we seem to have a particular problem with people uh, who know that they value this stuff and, and then try to exclude the rest of the society from participating, you know, by buying up uh, trophy ranches or mm -hmm. engaging in f fenced uh, compounds where they kind of cheat on the ethic side of stuff and and probably know nothing of, wa of the wildlife restoration sequence that this country has been through. Uh, to put that stuff out there. I mean, you see people coming into Montana, and a big part of it is because there's wildlife out there in that landscape. Mm -hmm. Well, there were ranchers and hunters and others before them that came to a agreement on the fact that we were not going to let this resource get away mm -hmm. and uh, restored it just f for the common good. Right. So you bring up, like, the ethics piece, and... Uh, you know, I think Le Leopold or Leopold talked about that. You know, like it's what you do when uh, when nobody's looking, right? When you're out in the woods, and kind of like how, like now, I'm sitting around the room with uh, four, you know, three other people that I think I share a lot of probably all the same like ethics um, when I'm out there on the ground. Um, but it's also different in different situations, right? Like, and, and everybody kind of has their own ethic. If you looked at, like, when you look at ethical situations, what helps you guide? Like, if you look at a certain situation, um, how do you, in your head, how do you wrestle with and how do you teach those concepts, like those ethics to people, like on what, how do you make that decision on what's good and what's bad or what's right and what's not? 
if you get that question. <laughs> I was kind of rambling, sorry. Well, I think you intuitively know. And, and I think uh, all you have to sort of come to grips with is the fact that there are other things that I'm out, other reasons I'm out here, other things I'm out here for other than a carcass. You know, I mean, I'm hunting because I want to harvest a wild animal. I know I'm doing it within a framework that is guaranteed to sustain the, that animal and, and the, those populations of animals. And I think you have to kind of have be at peace with yourself to start with. I mean, if you're going out there just to shoot a, a horny beast, why, you got a lot of challenges before. Are we talking during the rut or are we just talking antlers? No, I'm talking about the hunter the night <laughs> yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, on I, that question is answered uh, as how do I feel afterwards, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's a good point. I mean, one of the things that my nephew and I were talking about, he just, he just killed a big, big whitetail on the trip in Alabama. And um, he had taken a shot a couple of days earlier, and it was 110 yards, but it was in the woods. And he said, I knew it was the wrong shot. I knew. He said, as soon as I touched off the round, I knew it was the wrong thing to do. And he, they didn't get the deer, right? But he did, it, but he stayed with it. I said, you got to stay with it. And you'll, you, that, that it will work in the way that you feel right about it. And he did. But he said, he said, I didn't, I, I knew it wasn't right. And he learned something from that. He yeah. did, man. Yeah. He did. He'll never, he'll, he'll, he's, it's taken me more years than it's taken him. But it, you feel when you do it right, it's power and reward and you did it right. You know, I, uh, I interviewed a lot of folks who hunted on like elk farms at mm -hmm. one time in my writing career. And the, the common denominator of all of them was they said, well, it doesn't mean that much. You know, I've got it on the wall here. Exactly. None of them thought of that as, as, a, as a powerful emotional experience. None of them. Not afterwards. Right. Uh, it's, I think that's a tricky question. And, you know, I don't think it's okay to just, I, I think you have to go deeper than just saying you intuitively know. And I'm, my reaction to your first book was, <laughs> I don't understand why you wrote this. It's like, duh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> As I got older, I realized why you wrote that. <laughs> and I, you know, I think not to, to try to sell it, but the, the idea that says, I think, you know, that book takes like half an hour to read, maybe 45 minutes. And I think if you thumb through it and you find yourself disagreeing with it, you should spend some time figuring out why. Yeah, that's a good, great point. And I'll say to to your work as a uh, as a writer, when you can do Beyond Fair Chase and read it in forty five minutes to an hour, that that is a mark to me of an incredible writing because it is so simple and it is so well like like you get it forty five minutes. The other day they did a study on uh, the prose and how. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call you about this, and how uh, they studied Ernest Hemingway's prose and put it on some type of graph. He writes at about a fourth grade level. Yeah. Cormac McCarthy writes at about a sixth grade level, and most academic papers were at a twelfth grade plus to to incomprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got my first paper back at college, and it just said in red at the top, it said, "Just see me." <laughs> and so I went in to see the professor, and I was dutifully scared. And uh, he said, I suspect you have some really good content in here, but I don't know. <laughs> and he said, a smart person takes a complicated thing and makes it seem simple, not right. a simple thing and makes it complicated. Right. Now go back and write your content like you're writing a letter to your best friend, Right. which I did. And he said, there, that's how you should be writing from now on. There you go. And Jim has nailed that. And I think, yeah. I it, mean, like, I mean uh, – Beyond Fair Chase, and then Inherit the Hunt, and uh, Rifle in Hand, and then Taking a Bullet for Conservation. Like, all of those are easy, di easily digestible, right. I guess. And, like, I mean, I hand them out all the time to people. Um, and and I, 
like one it's it's crazy that they don't know that like you know you're like duh like kind of like right. that, that comment it's like if they didn't grow ra- up around it though That's it's right. really hard to like have that conservation ethic right. and maybe you you know rode around with your dad and like you rolled down the window and shot things out of the truck and then right. drove on you know, i mean I, mm-hmm. like that might be your only experience and so you don't know differently um i think so there's those books that you've written jim that are phenomenal then there's like a lot of theodore roosevelt kind of uh books that i've like you've turned me on to mm-hmm. wilderness hunters one of them um uh, roosevelt is not as accessible a writer as jim is oh no oh um, no that's i mean i i it's 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 they're not super as, dense but yeah, I'm, what i'm getting denser. at is like that's like they give you that history a little bit right. you know and like he did other things like the first president to ride in a car the first one to fly in an airplane i mean just right. like crazy stuff that was going on in his life then which is super interesting and then i've read uh rieger's book it's like sportsman and conservation mm-hmm. i think which just gives a good history is there other books besides kind of like roosevelt history yours this rieger book like that you would suggest well when we were approaching the 100th anniversary of Theodore Roosevelt's presidency, yeah. I was out of fish and game. And I told this, the boys, I said, for Christmas, anything by or about TR. <laughs> that bookcase there is what <laughs> I got for Christmas. <laughs> I had no idea how much there was. Mm-hmm. And one leads you to the other. Right. And I think if, you know, to make a study of TR, I would suggest getting a general uh, biography of him written and read that. Read his autobiography and then read Edith Roosevelt's. And you get, you'll see the points connect as you go across the spectrum of oh, what that's great. a biographer found, what TR wanted us to remember, and what his wife saw going on at the <laughs> same time. Yeah. And it. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I want Glenna writing a book about me. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's a lot of stuff that she probably sees that I don't want else to know about. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it, there is just so much good material. Yeah. You know, and there are people that spend years and years, but they give you the dates and they give you the the separate uh, kind of the uh, chaff that uh, bulks these books up. And I always, what I do is when I read one and I hit, a note worth remembering, I'll write that down. So each one of those books has a sheet of paper folded in front of it of things I want might want to go back to. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And otherwise, it just gets to be overwhelming, and you can't... I know I read that somewhere, but, sure. right. but now I have a method simple enough, but go back and find this stuff. And for cross-reference, right? Yeah. Yeah, right, right. And, of course, then when you read other biographies of people like the Gr- James and Granville Stewart, who were very important Montana, Montana. history figures, right. yeah. and you'll see guys, see their trails cross, like at the Stock Growers Convention in Miles City in 1886. Right. Granville Stewart was there. T.R. was there. And Granville Stewart was going north to, to chase some horse thieves as a vigilante. Right. Theodore Roosevelt and the Marquis de Morris wanted to sign up and ride with him. Mm-hmm. And Stewart says, not you guys. Your profiles are way too high for us. Uh-huh. <laughs> so. And they were talking about the stocking at that point, right? That, they were, like, that the range had too many animals yeah, on it. Yeah, right. right. That was Granville right. Stewart's thing. And yeah. Roosevelt was getting up in support of what Granville was saying. Right. right. That the overstocking of the range and... They called it at the time the Texification of Montana, uh-huh. but they were driving herds in here just to get on the grass that the buffalo used to eat. Right. You, you put me on to that uh, Granville Stewart as a as a conservation voice. You know, I I, I knew his history as a rancher and, right. a, and a pioneer. Um, but one of the things that was fascinating in that piece I read of yours that you're working on is um, that they came to Montana because they were blocked from going back across by the Mormon War right. in 1857. And so that directed, they couldn't use the trail through Salt Lake. So they had to go north, and they came across what's now Manita Pass yeah. and saw the sea of grass, the sagebrush. They said that the sa- this sagebrush, I'm getting yeah. all this from you. <laughs> <laughs> but the sagebrush petered out as they went into Montana, and there was this literally the sea of grass. Well, and I, like, and I, like the more you learn, right, I didn't know that part of that story. Oh. But I remember there was a grad student or something that was over in Bozeman that did, like, some little paper that you gave me, like, when I first started out my 
conservation career. Mm -hmm. And I talked about the Stuarts and like in the 1870s, like uh, when all these mining camps were just, you know, talk about market killing. I and mean, that was to eat, right? I mean, yeah. they were just decimating wildlife. Yeah. And that's where those kind of first game laws came into place, right? 1872, yeah. right? I and mean, that's like that's Battle of the Bighorn, correct? Like with uh, like Custer and still was around? Yeah. It, uh, the first conservation legislation in Montana, and this comes out of a master's thesis of a gal named Joni Louise Brownell. God, One little gem that pops up. And uh, in there you find out that James Stewart, Granville's brother, put in legislation to protect fish in 1864, the first territorial legislature. Mm -hmm. Granville, the brother, put in legislation to put uh, closed seasons on some big game in Buffalo in 1872. Well. Both those events were before Custer died at Little Bighorn in 1876. Right, right. So we were protecting fish 12 years before Custer died right. by restricting fishing in Montana territory to a hook and line. Mm -hmm. And we started trying to protect the game uh, four years before Custer dies. But the <coughs> there was no infrastructure to enforce any of that stuff. Right. And so the buffalo slaughter went on right in that same time window. Right. But there are individuals that are stepping up at that point that, yeah. just in my mind, like, since that wildlife kind of belonged to the people, they want to make sure it was around for, you know, future generations. And so yeah. instead of just watching this thing go, they stood up and rose their hand, right? And there's always yep. been people who seemed to know what was right. Yeah. Um. I mean, which we're so lucky. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, if you if you go back to Andrew Garcia, you know, in Tough Trip Through Paradise, mm -hmm. he thought the, the slaughter of the buffalo was nuts. It would, or nobody. I mean, I mean, if if you look at our history, it goes back to what you're talking about the Copper Kings or what we're taught. Mm -hmm. We were seldom taught that people were going, "No, man, that ain't right." Right. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm, I remember being confronted by that when I left Montana. Like, you know, there wasn't a lot of concern about hunting places because you always had sort of this unlimited number to go to. And I assumed when you left the state, you'd have the same thing. And uh, it wasn't. And my moment was uh, after I'd figured it out, I remembered seeing a river in Washington state called the Tianaway River and thinking it would be good. I had two really young daughters and I didn't want to be on a big river because I knew they were going to be with me. And it's basically the sort of size of the little Blackfoot. And uh, we drove 26 miles up that river, and there was not a single place where we could access it to go fishing. And I went hunting one time, and my permit was good for 72 hours. And the, the district I, hunt, I drew for was about 40 acres, and it was where a power line came through which was the reason the public could access it was because the easement already existed and my job was to sit under that power line and hope something ran in front of me that day. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, Washington's a pretty progressive state, right. but they don't have this history. And so I started doing this project where I was just sort of looking around to see how is this actually different. And, you know, places like Wyoming, where the landowner owns the river under the ground under the river, you can't anchor up and fish in places. You know, they were kind enough to leave you an exclusion for an accidental bumping of your oar, which I think is awfully big of them. <laughs> but other than that, like the notion of high water mark, um, that doesn't mean anything. And. Um, you know, that's to me, along with the idea of, you know, having to understand the history for people in Montana, understanding how good you have it and understanding what happens when you don't pay attention. It's all on the table. It's right. all on the table unless you do something about it. Yeah. And that rally, I mean, with 1,200 people, what I loved about that rally is, is that you had uh, kind of the sage wisdom in that room of people that I've known in this state for 20 plus years now. And you had people that I have never met in my life that were, you know, like the powers of social media. We had three kids that are members of ours drive from Miles City, you know, <laughs> like I mean, well, long distances, right. you know, and like taking a Monday off of work. And so I feel like that, you know, that that combination of sage wisdom and history combined with that youthful exuberance. Like you saw that in spades, you know, at the at the rally and um, which gives me hope. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the point there is just you can give them power because they're there because of an intuitive feeling quite often yeah. and a personal experience or whatever. But if they knew the story of all the people that had, s you know, put it on the line, had showed up, 
that stood up at critical times to make that all happen. You just strengthen their side against those who were just simply exploited yeah. and capitalize on it. And, uh, and capitalize on somebody else's work as well. Like those, they, I, I go back to, uh, uh, I've been in Montana 27 years, you know, and I've, I've basically raised my family here because of public lands and wildlife. And I was thinking about when you talk about you got your residency, mm -hmm. you know, and I was one year in, I was working at the Rudkin Ranch in Stevensville, and I sat there and I was like, those elk tags to me were like a ticket to p paradise, really, you know. And uh, I, I, that's why I've, I've raised my family here. Oh. And what I guess, and, and you if you look at the Nantahalia National Forest or the Pisgah in the east, those were logged absolutely flat. And they were carefully restored. And I think there was a Weeks Act allowed the government to buy abandoned uh, forest land in the east in 1911. They were carefully restored, you know. When when this pub anti-public lands movement comes to the east, you know, what are people going to do? Yeah. Now, here's a point about exactly what you were talking about there because the Weeks Act in 11 came after the Congressional Act in 07 that tried to stop Theodore Roosevelt from throwing any more land into the forest reserves in six western states, okay. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. And, be, and they brought it through Congress as a rider on the Ag Appropriations Bill to veto-proof it as much as they could. And that act passed Congress, was uh, on Theodore Roosevelt's desk waiting for him to sign or veto it, and they were sitting there planning to the override the veto. Okay. And he had seven days to take that, make that decision. And in those seven days... In those six western states, he created 21 new national forests, added 16 <laughs> million acres to the forest reserves, signed the executive orders creating those forests, and then he signed the bill prohibiting him from ever doing it again. And he wow. said, my opponents did handsprings in their wrath and dire were their threats, <laughs> which only <laughs> attests to the efficiency of our action. <laughs> nice. But then the spinoff of that was the Weeks Act, to start buying forest lands in the east. Completely the abandoned. Because you yeah. see the value of them. You, no. Like future value, right? Like no. Right. They, well, in one, but they had eroded so that they were plugging up the rivers. And they were, they were, they were destroying the entire basic infrastructure. The restoration needed to happen. It either had to happen, or uh, I think it was the French Broad River in North Carolina. Um, the Monongahela, I know, is famous for taking out that town in a flood because of the, the deforestation of the watershed. Um, it was uh, it was dire. We were on the same trajectory that Iraq took 7,000 exactly. years ago. It's crazy. Stripping the forest, overgrazing the pastures, and turning it to sand piles. Right. Jim, one of the things I like about, like, uh, rifle in hand is, like, you know, we hear these names like Roosevelt and Pinchot and, you know, Leopold and Rachel Carson and, like, and Ding Darling, like all these big names that had uh, big impacts on the conservation history in this country. But, like, in that book, there's that story about, like, the game warden, you know, who uh, right. was cleaning stuff up down in the south, you know, and, like, and I don't remember his name now. Alfred Aldrich okay, Richardson. And I knew you would. <laughs> 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 um, but... But again, like his name is probably lost in history besides you telling that story. But what I think it tells is that no matter kind of what roles people are playing, big or small, like all of us have built what we have now and all of us have a responsibility to carry it forward. And so, you know, small things like going to the rally and just standing there and pounding your fist to making a phone call to, you know, being a, a, a world class author, like everybody has their different roles. And, um, you know, without us stepping up, it can be gone pretty quickly. And, and what it is we're talking about, to me, is an irrefutable good. I mean, mm -hmm. it, I mean it, it's what a free people does, a, what, a, what free people do when they are at their best. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I kept coming back to. Uh, it, so, Jim, um, one of the questions I had on here was uh, if you were – if you had a, a, a magic wand and – 
what would you accomplish? What What do you think is ne most needs to be accomplished right now? And I know we talked about well, we talked about getting the history in, telling well, the I stories. But what is what right is now and almost any time in any battle is education. Okay. You know, take the time to self-educate if nobody's offering you something. Because there's such power in the story and such beauty in the story and so much personal satisfaction. Right. Just like those three guys I met in the right. woods one day. And uh, I'll never forget that moment. I'll forget right. the details of how I shot that deer over there or that elk behind you or this antelope up here. Right. But meeting those people in the forest, blue collar as can be, and they were enjoying the beauty of living and the joy of life. Right. And those kids lit up with excitement. I mean, that's not like sitting in a rubble pile in, in Syria with right. a bowl in your hand hoping somebody dumps some rice in it. Right. I mean, this is demonstration of what free people can do in a democratic government. Right. And uh, the more you learn of that story, the richer your experiences become. And then you think back of all the wonderful things that went on in your life uh, that are enriched when you learn, wow, that's why that was there. <laughs> right. You know, that elk in the Rocky Mountain front west of Augusta, well, thank you, Carl Malone and Tom Maselt. I didn't right. know you were there before, right. but I know you were there now. And I know that that elk tenderloin in my freezer came from you. Right, <laughs> right. I, the understanding the why is really important. I, there's a story about during the Revolutionary War where George Washington and the, the, the folks he was leading, they were getting routinely beat. Mm -hmm. And this was when they had sort of crossed over in retreat and they, had, they were spending that winter and they were not doing well. And uh, he had engaged, I think the guy's name was von Steuben or von Steubing, who actually had military experience from the Prussian military. And there's a quote from him where they're drilling and learning things. And he said, you know, he, he writes this note to himself. It said, I've never seen anything like these Americans. You tell them what to do and they won't do it. If you explain to them why to do it, they're the best soldiers you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. And I think of that story as being really uniquely American, but yeah. really, really important. It's one thing to know the facts. It's the second thing to be convicted about them. And if you don't understand yeah. the why, you're not going to carry that conviction. Right. Yeah, because I've been questioning myself lately, um, watching social media, watching the comment threads or whatever, of so many people who seem to um, be, they're so angry at something that they're willing to give up what they have in order to make a statement about their anger. I, I it's, it's not something that I've been able to understand. <laughs> they, don't rep they don't recognize the risk. It's all been delivered to them, and they don't know they can lose it. I, I think th I think that's right. Um, I would say to whom much is given, much is expected. Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah, I mean, there's the whole thread of this, which is yes, we have the freedom to do it, which gives you the, which requires the responsibility. But I mean, I like, and I think that's something yes. that drives me. I'm sitting in here with one of you know the greatest mentors of my life, and like. I have pictures of him, my dad, and Theodore Roosevelt that sit behind me at, at work, you know, and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, without those people in my life, I'm not doing what I'm doing now, and it's just like, this is our responsibility to carry right. this on, you know, and it's like, like you just said, like, we have this grave responsibility, and, you know, and I think about, you know, putting It's joyful, too. Oh, it's totally yeah. joyful. Yeah, I mean, for I, sure. I, and I, I mean, I love, I love the, um, knowing that in history, because you know, uh, like, that you're part of this kind right. of, uh, this conservation legacy. Right. Uh, and that, you know, it's so short and it's like, so you can, I mean, there's still impacts that you can make on it. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that's what we're trying to do as an organization. I think, uh, a story I'll tell real quickly is I had a woman that worked for me uh, when she first started, when I first started, she was the first person I hired. And then, uh, she just took a new job this fall and, uh, um, and you know, she got, she's getting paid twice as much money. Like she's doing, you know, she's going to stay in conservation, but in a different way. But I, my daughter, my eight year old Sydney had fallen in love with this girl and just loved her and and so i come home and i tell her that caitlin is leaving and right. sydney physically breaks down for like 30 minutes like she's crying finally i can console her a little bit and i ask her i'm like sid so what's going on she's like well what is she doing and i said well she's taking a job and, and so she's like well that's not conservation and i said no and she's like well is there anything like 
that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and at that moment in time, one, I feel like I'm brainwashing my daughter maybe a little too much. <laughs> but that's what I want. I want her and her cronies like to be able to be, pick up this mantle when I'm sitting See, in gym matters. seat. Yeah, wh- that, and they care that this matters, right. and they have a joy about being engaged in it. It's not work right. to them. It's something they care about. And right. I, so I, I just bring that story up because I, I, like, I feel like that's what we're doing. All we're doing is carrying on the legacy that's been given to us and then hopefully pass it on to somebody else. Right. Well, it's it like I said it is a it is a tall responsibility. Yeah. But when you when you do that thing like that big horn sheep hunt you did, yeah. Or this year I was in with my son on the uh South Fork of the Sun, you know, and he's packing in the Bob Marshall. Mm-hmm. So he packed the camp in and I I mean I there ain't nothing bigger than that to me. And there's nothing more like healthier, like like for a, for a a democratic republic, for the people to have that, like 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 they I may not own any land. I own right. a very small piece of land in Augusta, and my house is right in the middle of it. But I am invested in this country through this experience that I can have both on public lands and hunting for wildlife. So I, I'm, I'm I am deeply invested in the United States of America. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate to give this thought, but it popped in my head, so I'm going to give it to you. Is there's all these like these these fads, right? Like this kind of like like the CrossFit workout or like right. the South Beach diet or whatever. I'm like, you know what? There should be like the Bob Marshall freaking like workout plan. Like you go spend <laughs> like a month in the Bob Marshall, right. and I guarantee you're going to come out lean and mean. <laughs> right. And so whether that's the Bob Marshall or just like the public land workout. Right. Like you bet. Go out there and spend some time in that in those woods, and you right. know. And, and I definitely need to do it right now. But like it's you know that will teach you real quickly. You bet. Well, that's yeah. a great point, though, because as uh, the politicians wither the Forest Service budget, right. as part of a strategy to be able to argue they're not being managed properly. The the public sector is filling in the gaps. You right. got the friends of the Bob Marshall up there with a Pulaski in their hand, sure. cleaning up the trails. Right. And so, as the principle and idealism that Jack Ward Thomas, former chief of the Forest Service, talked about, that they are being compromised uh, little by little by little. And here we see in a democracy the people stepping up doing trail work, you know, and uh, cleaning up campgrounds and and monitoring rivers and things like that. That's right, yeah. And so uh, we are demonstrating that we are willing to invest more than just rhetoric in our public lands. And it's a relatively recent phenomenon, you know. I mean, it's not that many years ago that we, you know, that Ehlers Coke rode into the, s- into the Sun River. That was... Uh, 1905 and 1906 that he wrote about, mm-hmm. no game. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you didn't you didn't hear the story, but he and I were talking about this on the phone. I had just made this big loop. Uh, not it's actually outside the wilderness. Okay. In what's now the conservation management area mm-hmm. for the for the hair under the Heritage Act. Yeah. But uh, he, you know there was like these trails are huge. Like there's grizz in there. They had woken up. It was early season. There was a lot going on on that loop, and uh. He, and he was telling me that Ehlers Coke had ridden that same thing and I seen, seen not one game animal. With in the exception of one mountain goat in 60 days, 30 in 05, 30 Whoa. in 06. Right. Through the wildest country we got, with the exception of one mountain goat, never saw or got a shot at a single being game animal. Wow. wow. Now that thing is just teeny. Well, that's where I got the cow tags. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, or the either sex tag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ended up being a cow tag. Yeah. Um, Jim, uh, like I think we're wrapping stuff up, but like any parting wisdom for us, and we can all do kind of, I guess, uh, our last thoughts. I think one of the things you also learn when you study history, that there are random events that change everything, things that don't fall into anybody's planning pattern. You know, for example, Theodore Roosevelt (coughs) was locked into the vice presidency to get him out of the way of his reform program in New York State. And up up pops Leon Zolgaz, uh, shoots McKinley, and all of a sudden this guy, they got locked, buried. In fact, Theodore wrote about that vice presidency. He said, this job is nothing but the fifth wheel of the coach. It's the road to nowhere but oblivion. Mm -hmm. 
their strategy, their thoughtful process at the political level was working. But here comes a random event. An assassination changes everything. Mm -hmm. Changes absolutely everything. Puts us in this room today. Right. Because Emma Hauptmann, an anarchist, didn't think anybody should have three presidential <laughs> terms. And so one of her disciples goes and assassinates McKinley. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the guy who shoots Roosevelt in uh, 1912, he was, his claim was that it was McKinley's ghost that told him to go do that. <laughs> 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 but it just, I mean, history is a fun place to yes, wander through. I think I got, remember Mark Hanna, the, the industrialist? Right. He, he, he called it, and he, when they bottled up TR in the vice presidency, he was the only one that said, do you realize that you're just one madman's bullet away from, no, we're just one bullet away from having that madman as the president? <laughs> and then on the funeral train, the same guy <laughs> says, I told McKinley it was a mistake to nominate that wild man. And now look, that damn cowboy is president of the United States. <laughs> that was also so beautiful. stay alert to random events. Uh -huh. And maybe the current election is going to qualify for that in a yeah. historical context where some guy comes out of nowhere, has enough capital to pull off grabbing that seat. Yeah. And you got to be prepared to react to those things, mm -hmm. to not uh, fall back and say, well, it's always been one way or always been another way, because they do change the trajectory. And uh, I think to be a plan for the future, all right, and plan to have a strong organization and, and, pl and participate in land use planning. Sure but be alert to the fact that things can come along and that you got to be ready to saddle up and ride. Ooh. Right on. Oh, <laughs> yep. I'm going up San Juan Hill right now. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, growing up, uh, you had a lot of brothers. and Yeah, I had five older brothers. Okay. And uh, growing up with Jim Poswitz as the, the leader of that crew <laughs> yeah and it's you know i think the fathers and son thing has a has its own sort of bend on it and i uh i remember uh being frustrated as a kid that our vacations were 10 day trips in the absorky bear tooth backpack and you know mm -hmm. six days of food and the rest you were going to get while you were there <laughs> and resenting yeah, yeah. as my friends went off to disneyland and now as a, a as a father myself i look back on that and say i'm really glad i've never set foot in disneyland and that i have the memory of these these uh, th these were brutal trips, and you talk about the workout, and I remember we would always do it like the first two weeks in August, and we would come back, and football practice would always start in middle of August. And they'd always start with like the mile run, right. and no one had done anything. I mean, we were right. young at the time, and I remember coming out of the Absorkies and heading into that mile run going, I have no idea what you people are talking about, and just zoom, zoom, <laughs> zoom, zoom, <laughs> zoom. Um, and, and, yeah, but I, I think that uh, – I think in a lot of ways I had uh, – you, if you don't get exposed to the other part of it, you can sort of end up in your own echo chamber. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I'm glad I, I went and spent time sort of outside all of this. Right. Um, because I feel like I can put myself in, their, in other people's shoes now in yeah. a more effective way. And I think that that makes me a more effective advocate, frankly, is, mm -hmm. is that I have a really good understanding of where other people are coming from mm -hmm. uh, on that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I still react to the book with the duh. Right, right. true, true. This is what the, this is what I know. This is not yeah. debatable. Right, right. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel lucky. I've already said it already. I feel very lucky to have Jim in my life. I think that, um, you know, the thing that he's probably imparted on me most is this history piece that we talked about today. And I think I get to do a lot of traveling around the country and go talk to different groups and um, something that Jim has taught me that I will tell everybody that's listening to this is like when you know your own history and even if it's not your history, it's their history and you can tell them that mm -hmm. there's a thing of power in that, that is hard to describe. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, you go to these places, North Dakota was one, one of my first times I was working for National Wildlife Federation, went up there and I gave a talk and I gave a history of, you know, when they, their first people that went to the first North American conference where the National Wildlife Federation was formed, 
and told them their names and they had no idea of that story. And mm -hmm. so like they're sitting there and here's this young kid and I think I was in my early 30s at that point or maybe, you know, and, and like I just done a little bit of research to tell them their right. story. And then they were coming up to me being, thank you so much. I did not know that. And so they're giving a sense of, you know, like where they came from as a storied organization, but they really had no idea because that story hadn't been told. And so right. I think that that history piece is an important one. And, I, and, I, and then I think the second thing I will take out of this today is what Jim kind of ended with is when we have these times, the ability to take action in a, in a decisive and nimble way right. versus sitting around and kind of wondering, hey, planning for, hey, this just happened. Let's sit around for a month and figure out what we're going to do about it. Right. Is that you may not do that perfectly every single time, but at least you're in the arena, right? Back to that arena speech. And you got a little, you know, dirt on your face and, and sweat on your brow. And you're learning from those battles. And I think, you know, again, for those people listening, we are just starting to awake, I think, this, uh, this new kind of um, sportsman uh, uh, constituency that doesn't know the story necessarily, but is starting to awaken to that this stuff has means so much to them. And so hopefully right. we can take that, bottle it up a little bit, and then get those warriors out there and use our modern things like podcasts, like social media, um, to really educate the people and to get them to act. Because if we don't, um, again, that's, I think, the biggest tragedy if I'm sitting there in Jim's seat, you know, and we just didn't do it. And, you know, that's going to be a, um, a huge weight on my shoulders and, and one I hope that everybody that's listening to this would care about, too. You bet. Any closing thoughts, Jim? Well, saddle up and ride worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> Following up on what Land said. I yeah. mean, here I'm sitting out at age 81 plus, almost 82. And Yesterday's independent record, front page picture, is over a thousand people plugging up the state capitol with a retention and appreciation of public lands. Right. And you realize that whatever effort you put into all the years that preceded, it, there's a great deal of satisfaction there I because bet. it was not cast out on infertile waters right. and there they came and it gives you a huge satisfaction with your life right. to say okay I can go in peace mm -hmm. they are there mm -hmm. well I have nothing to add to that I'll tell you that's <laughs> Saddle like up and ride. I think we're going to make a T-shirt yeah. with your face on it. Saddle <laughs> up and ride. This thing just so like hockey. <coughs> yeah, that wasn't much of a cowboy <laughs> life. <laughs> well, I tell you, as a, uh, to close it, if, if people are listening to this if, as a writer, you know, what I, what I do covering conservation, it, it, begs, it doesn't actually exist without what Jim, what, what I read and learned from you. I mean, those, that, that is – it, it was essential to me to cover conservation for field and stream or to do all the other stuff. That's, that's, that's what I, I read that stuff. And I said, this is, this is like what interests me, you know? So it, as a writer, uh, if people want to be writing and communicating, read those books um, and, and look at what it looks like when it's done simply and, and delivers the message, it delivers the message that, that, delivers the history that's not a message i'm not interested in more interesting messaging i'm interested in the facts and the history yeah and those it's it's and it's in jim's work totally thanks a lot on a lot of levels <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks jim no i owe us all to land yeah <laughs> Most, we of all what, do. most of what I did and talked about all happened in the company of his father. Mm -hmm. And when the governor in 1982 was tearing down my unit inside the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Land's dad was in the governor's office, and I don't know how he knew they were calling me over to do that on this December morning in 82. Mm -hmm. But he was there. And I asked both Land and, and Robin, Land's mother, if Phil ever told them why, how he knew this was going to happen and how he made his way mm -hmm. to be present. Mm -hmm. But the governor started that conversation by saying, 
and he was they were getting some heat from the environmental movement because the rumor was out that they were going to tear down my unit and uh, the governor opened the conversation by saying Philip you've got a firestorm going on out there and I want to see it stopped and Philip's response was governor I haven't raised a finger yet but if you want to see a firestorm I will show you one <laughs> nice <laughs> and that kicked off two minutes of debate the end of which is my people would all be kept mm -hmm. and I would be given meaningful work which was <laughs> not defined but it was not being thrown out the door into the street either mm -hmm. And it was during that kept man period of uh, roughly uh, 83 through uh, 93 that I had time to do all kinds of stuff, including learning a lot of what we're spitting out here today. Aha. Uh -huh. So. Well, one of my questions here was, <laughs> <laughs> how did you have the time you know how did you how did you accomplish those those books while raising all those sons and I, I'm assuming uh, Gail was a big part of that too. Was that well? Right in the house I had a, my wife at the time was Helen. Okay, and she was the mother of all the boys. And uh, I think I started writing that book when we moved into Madison Avenue. Up there. No Not university. In Not in New York City, right? No, no, M Helena, Montana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, no, it was the house on University. On University, that's that's right. On University. Uh, so Andrew was just getting out of high school then. Right. So the boys had just all into college, high school, or careers, mm -hmm. or all into college or careers, and uh, actually publisher of Falcon Press at the time, a guy named Bill Schneider, I used know to Bill. work for me as uh -huh. Montana Outdoors. Mm -hmm. And uh, he threw a copy of Strunk and White into my lap. Mm -hmm. And he said, write me a book about this size on hunter ethics. And the Strunk and White would be the elements of style, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. And so wow. that's, a, that's the encouragement and the, the trigger that started it. Unreal. And, then, and it actually didn't take very long. Because this stuff is all stuck up in there, and and uh, I was a big fan of uh, of a longshoreman philosopher Eric Hoffer. Yep. And I had read a number of his the books. The True Believer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. The Temper of Our Times. The True Believer. Wow. And uh, I could really like the way he wrote. You know, short sentences, right to the point. Don't write to be understood. Write so you cannot possibly be misunderstood. Was okay. the council, <laughs> and so I took the time to to punch that out, and then all the stuff that occurs <laughs> to you, uh, was, you know, residual material you kept out of it to keep it too brief and to the point and on the right. subject, that became inherit the hunt. Okay. And then as I'm getting Rooseveltized by all the uh, books my boys were producing for or sending to me. Yeah. Uh, I thought, God, I, you know, I'm just fishing out the conservation, hunting, nature stuff. Mm -hmm. And then all the other things, I'm reading it and appreciating it, but what my brain is making record of retrieving. And when you sew all those events together, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it becomes a fabric of itself, and uh, that became rifle in hand, how Wild okay. America was saved. Gotcha. Well, there's a quick tutorial on writing as well. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. That's why we did this. I mean, Hal and I were talking, you know, about this is that, um, you know, we want to make sure this story is told. And so I think let's make this like one of the first installments of uh, some other conversation. Yeah, if we can, if we could do that, that would be uh, ideal. Um, I just I'm going to go down to that used bookstore down here and, and try to find that Eric Holford book. <laughs> on my way out of town today. That's right in there. Yeah, I'll look <laughs> at it. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, man.